Hi, this is Michael Altos. We are continuing our discussion of cardiac physiology, and this is recording part 7. I'd like to review a, a few of the most common, or at least the most commonly discussed, congenital heart diseases. These are structural diseases that patients are born with and they can be divided into acyanotic and cyanotic congenital heart diseases. The non-cyanotic heart diseases usually involve a left to right shunt, which means oxygenated blood is being recirculated back to the pulmonary side. As a result, they have increased pulmonary blood flow. Their pulmonary circulation is seeing the same blood over and over again. And this can lead to pulmonary hypertension, right ventricular hypertrophy, and congestive heart failure. An atrial septal defect, an ASD, is one of the most common congenital heart diseases. We see shunting of blood from the left atrium to the right atrium, and then, of course, the blood will go back into the ventricle to the lungs, and then when it returns to the left atrium, some of it is shunted back to the right atrium again. As the shunt gets larger and larger, pulmonary blood flow starts to increase and the pulmonary valve closure is delayed. So these patients may have a very widely split and fixed S2. These patients don't want to have hypertension or increased peripheral vascular resistance because that increases pressures on the left side, which will increase the shunting back to the right side. We also don't want to have any air bubbles in the venous circulation because even though the shunt is mostly left to right, if any bubbles go from right to left, then we have bubbles in the LV system, and those bubbles can go to any part of the body, including the brain. Patients can also have a ventricular septal defect, where the shunt is instead of the atrium, it's in the ventricle. Small VSDs actually have very little disturbance, but as the defect becomes larger, Patients will, of course, first have shunting from the left to the right side because pressures on the left side are much, much higher than they are on the right side. And because systemic vascular resistance is much higher than pulmonary vascular resistance. So with all the excess blood on the right side, patients start to develop pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular hypertrophy. Eventually, this becomes so severe that you start to get right to left shunting because pressures get so high in the right ventricle. And eventually this leads to ventricular failure. Similar to ASDs, we want to avoid hypertension or decrease pulmonary vascular resistance. We want to avoid anything that worsens this left to right shunt. And we still want to avoid introducing air bubbles into the venous circulation. So those are two acyanotic heart diseases. Patients can also have cyanotic heart diseases where the primary problem is a right to left shunt. So we have deoxygenated blood that's bypassing the lungs and going straight to the systemic circulation. And these patients are chronically hypoxic. The hypoxia leads to erythrocytosis, which means increased levels of red blood cells as the body tries to make up for the lack of oxygen. These patients are also at risk for brain abscesses. You may see that IV drugs have a very rapid onset as the drugs go straight from the venous circulation to the arterial circulation. We need extreme caution with air bubbles in these patients in the IV. And general anesthesia usually makes the shunt worse as they vasodilate and you give them positive pressure ventilation. One of the most common cyanotic congenital heart disease is called Tetralogy of Fallot. It has four components, a large VSD, the aorta overriding the right and the left ventricle. So here's your aorta overriding the left and right ventricle. So you can see right ventricular blood can go straight out the aorta. Right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. You can see that right ventricular outflow tract is narrowed. Again, encouraging blood to, to shunt to the left side. And they develop right ventricular hypertrophy. As SVR changes, as your blood pressure changes, the degree of shunt will change as well. And patients, even little children, learn to use this to their favor. So they will squat down, which increases systemic vascular resistance, decreases the shunt, and improves their oxygenation. Patients develop hypercyanotic attacks, commonly called TET spells, mostly in children and young adults, but not so much in older patients. 
crying, defecation, exercise are all things that can lead to a tet spell, although sometimes they come about for no reason at all. We can give these patients propranolol, which may help relieve spasm of the outflow tract, and we want to avoid beta agonists. The main management pearls in patients with tetralogy of Fallot is to maintain adequate SVR to minimize shunting, keep them well hydrated. Ketamine and nitrous may actually be very good anesthetics for these patients, and we should be cautious with most other anesthetic agents, again, because they drop SVR. Eisenmenger syndrome is when the left-to-right shunt reverses and becomes a right-to-left shunt. So this occurs when your peripheral, I'm sorry, when your pulmonary vascular resistance increases until it exceeds systemic vascular resistance. At that point, blood shunts from right to left. Patients become cyanotic. They can't tolerate, tolerate exercise. They may develop atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. And there really aren't very many effective treatments for Eisenmenger syndrome. It's a pretty severe complication of long-standing congenital heart disease. That's it for our discussion of congenital heart disease. And with that, we'll stop our discussion of cardiac physiology. Thanks for your attention. Please let me know if you have any questions. And we'll see you next time.